Dr. Cole, welcome back. My goodness, thank you so much for having me. It's been a long time, my friend, and you've been up to a lot. A new book, a new podcast. How do you, we were talking about this before the show, but I just want to know, like, how do you keep all of this together? An amazing team, um, an amazing wife, amazing family. Uh, you, it's uh, anybody that does uh, that does a lot of work and you know professionally it needs to have a great team around them. I, maybe not needs, but the people that I've seen uh, really be impactful. They can't do it alone. Mm-hmm. So uh, um, I'm so grateful for them and you know, everybody. But my team's amazing. Uh, like I, I mentioned to you, most of them have been with me close to a decade, um, and um, my day job hasn't changed. My focus is my patients m- Monday through. Thursday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., I'm consulting patients around the world via webcam and providing them a lifeline, functional medicine guidance and getting them labs and access to this amazing field of healthcare that I'm passionate about. Mm-hmm. So, and we, ha- we deal with complex cases. We deal with very um, difficult cases, cases that require a lot of attention and um, it really immer- us to immerse ourselves in them. Because they're not; um, these are not cases that they, this is their first foray in functional medicine. They've seen a lot of conventional doctors. They've exhausted all those options. So, and they've seen many people in the conventional, uh, sorry, the functional and the integrative and naturopathic world or the whatever alternative world. Uh, so, that requires a great team as well. So, we have um, that's all kind of stayed the same over the past decade. But all the other stuff that I'm doing is really just an extension of that. So like the books that I would write, the ketotarian or the inflammation spectrum, both are just extensions on what I've seen with patients, even the podcast, even Goop Fellows. I own, the only thing I can bring to the table is my insight into functional medicine. And it, it's my years of consulting patients, I think of me being curious and asking questions and wanting to get to the root cause and kind of going past the fluffiness, mm-hmm. I think has served what I could bring to Goop Fellas more because of my experience with patients. Because yeah. I'm used to asking questions and wanting to dig in deep to the stuff that matters. So that's what, what we get to do on that show. So in terms of quantity of patients, has that gone down at all? Or are you still seeing in similar quantity? I'm still seeing similar quantity. Yeah. So I, I've been able to um, keep a good doctor to patient ratio. So mm-hmm. we um, and we can't help everybody. And for somebody yeah. that isn't a good candidate or where it is too, too much for our patient, though, we don't want to um, have that impact the quality of care. So of we would just we could delay care for some people, push them back a little bit if that's possible, or we refer them to another great person in functional medicine. Um, but that oftentimes isn't needed. We, we definitely delegate and scale appropriately. We have brought more people on the patient team to provide that care. So it is a lot more an, an enrichment experiential time for people to immerse themselves in functional medicine. And we, we, the team that we have scaled is the patient team where I'm still doing all the main consultations, but uh, the in-between visits, because we run as a concierge functional medicine practice and anybody mm-hmm. dealing with autoimmune issues or chronic health problems will know that the real life happens in when you're not talking to a doctor. Yeah. So we need to not only be available on the visits, but be, in, be available for them in between visits. So that's where the email and phone support, because we are seeing patients via webcam, uh, really matters. Mm-hmm. So it is an immersive concierge functional medicine experience. That's what we have scaled because mm-hmm. uh, we need to, because you can't provide the people the level of care that they need for these complex cases with just being going through the motions or, and you can't do it with one person uh, because if I'm in a consult where I'm really immersing myself in their case, there's tons of other patients that need that support there too. So we, we have a great patient support team and we have a team meeting every morning. We have deep dives every Tuesday. Um, so we are always refining the cases and vetting everything they're getting and providing them the guidance that they need. Uh, it's very, very important to me because I see really good intentions with other systems, uh, but a lot of things fall through the cracks in other systems, not yeah. 
well, not n not intentionally. It's just there's a lot to manage with these cases, and you need a very thorough net to be there for them and yeah. to be a guidance and support system and structure and follow through. Because sometimes the, it's like set it and forget it with doctors, and it's like very disorganized. I, I, I need organization for my for my own self and my own team, but the patient needs organization too and certainty. This is beautiful. And at some point I'm going to pick your brain about this separately offline because as <laughs> I think about how to structure my own, this sounds amazing to me. Uh, I, I want to go down some of the typical patients that you see, but just given all the news right now, I think there's something I want to touch on first. COVID-19. And I haven't really delved deep into it on the show because, you know, getting the right people is, is key to me. But how do you look at this? Because I'm sure you get the question from your patients all the time. How do you look at this in terms of what we know, what we don't know? And then is there any kind of general rules of thumb people should be following other than they should have been healthy in the first place? Yeah, yeah we live in definitely interesting times. And, you know, it's if you look throughout human history and the last, I mean, in 2009, I guess, with H1N1, uh, that kind of is along the same lines. We saw the writing on the wall that this was just a matter of when, not if it was going to happen. And then you go back to 1918 uh, with the Spanish flu. Um, and it looks like, I mean, we know a lot more about how viruses spread and measures we can take when compared to 1918. Uh, so if I would encourage people to maybe look at what was done in 1918 and the world is resilient. I mean, we, we went, we went through 1918 with the Spanish flu pandemic and we're still resilient and we moved through that. And that was in many ways far worse statistically at this point, comparing that to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is, you know, we have to just be, we have to be smart. And I think that the measures that the countries are taking at this point, again, at, as we're recording right now, things may have changed over of course. the weeks. But uh, at this point, I think the measures of blunting the, the transmission curve is a good thing. And I would rather us look back on this and say we overreacted than underreacted mm -hmm. to decrease. But unlike 1918, which was largely impacting guys, pe young people in their 20s to 40s, this seems to be, for the most part, impacting elderly people and impacting people that are immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. um, so not that that makes it any better, but it's just a different beast. It's, it's impacting different people. And what it seems like, at least this time around, uh, if you are healthy, uh, you the chances are actually quite low compared to, to 1918. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the social distancing is smart. I think supporting a healthy immune system is smart. Like you said, the the best thing we can do is have a healthy foundation because it seems like things like smoking, which really impacted men in China, obesity is a, a risk factor. People with immune compromisation is a risk factor and uh, old age is a risk factor. Mm -hmm. So the things we can control, we can't change our age and you can't necessarily, if somebody is on immunosuppressant or has some horrible health problem, they can't necessarily change that right now. But the things we can control is being the healthiest we can be and changing and controlling the things we can control. So that obviously with the advice of washing hands, having, I think if anything, this has kind of helped the West be a little bit cleaner as far as how the things we take for granted that these, this can be a really great way to blunt transmission mm -hmm. uh, of the virus. But yeah, I, I eating a nutrient dense diet, taking care of yourself, uh, moving, being as healthy as you can be. These are all practical tips that people can do to have these mild to moderate cases where you're seeing, and I, I think without a doubt, I, as, as testing becomes more available and as time goes down, you're going to see that fatality rate drop from what the World Health Organization is saying around 3%, the fatality rate come down closer to one or under 1%. Because I think, in my opinion, I think, and I'm, let me caveat all of this with i am not a global health expert yeah. i'm not an epidemiologist but i'm looking at the, the stats out there i'm looking at the data and all i can bring is my functional medicine perspective mm -hmm. but when you compare this to other things throughout history um as more people are tested you're going to see these numbers come down because i really believe that there are a lot of cases out there that are mild to moderate 
that have been going on for a lot longer than what they even think. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are just aware of it now. We're seeing it now. And we are, these numbers are skewed because most of the people that are being tested are these people that are immunocompromised and elderly. So again, good that we're taking these measures. It's good that the world is waking up. Uh, and I, I posted this on Instagram the other day, and I really think that in anything we can learn, the silver lining in this is that I really feel that we are part of nature. We're not separate from it. And nature yeah. is teaching us something right now. Nature is teaching us that we are not separate from her and we need to be respectful and be mindful of this. And we need to be good stewards of the planet. And when you look at what's happening and where all this, what researchers are kind of looking at of out of Wuhan with these wet markets and how the animals are treated in, in those markets and the fact that SARS and MERS and now this are all coming out of these sort of really not good places when it comes to um, cleanliness. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that that's the biggest thing we can learn is how are we doing things as a planet, not just in China, but globally, that's unsustainable. And we need to do something different to see something different. So hopefully there's some positive things that come out of this and we can kind of reframe. I, I, I saw a meme recently. It said, uh, Mother Earth told us all to go to our rooms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's kind of, we, we are all being um, told to basically to slow down and reassess things and allow things to recalibrate. Because I mean, we have the... the, the, the um, the standard influenza, the, the actual flu, pandemics happen and then it calms down and it lives in, in us. It's more of a homeostasis. Yeah. So there's gonna be a homeostasis when it comes to COVID-19 as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, epidemiologists estimate that most of us are gonna get strands of it. Many of us won't have symptoms and that's how nature works. And um, so that's, that's ultimately my thoughts on it. What I'm focusing on with my patients is what can I do to support their immune system through this? And what can I do to help their mental, emotional components of all of this too, yeah. the stress and anxiety through it all? Because context matters. And I think if I can be a sounding board, but also a rootedness for them to give them context, because we live in a day and age that 1918 didn't have access to social media, endless scrolling news, where it is feeding this hysteria beyond the facts. And that's mm -hmm. not healthy. You know, and I think that that if I can create a soundness and a place of peace and calm through this storm, uh, it is that's what I'm trying to do for my patients. And you mentioned you're working with your patients, both from a nutrient standpoint, but also from this mental physical standpoint. If I, the nutrient standpoint, I understand that's bespoke and I don't necessarily want you to go down that route, but on the mental physical standpoint, aside from being a soundboard, are there basic practices that people can have? Like is meditation the right habit to pick up or is there other, other you know, tools in the toolbox that people should have during these times? Yeah, I would say one uh, at this point where we're at is is pick up a book, like read, dis disconnect from social media. I mean, we're I've always said this even before this pandemic, but social media and technology and the you know, internet is a double-edged sword. It's an amazing way to connect people, but it also is a source of stress and anxiety and social isolation in many ways, where people are connected but more disconnected like ever before. So. I would say read a book, be, sit in silence, be, um, find activities in your house that, find, that bring you joy. Uh, mm -hmm. Get out in nature. You know, it, it's, it, that is social distancing. You're not going to be around people. So go through the woods and walk and, and allow nature to ground you and bring you presence and heal you. I mean, the research coming out of South Korea and Japan as far as forest bathing and the impact yeah. it can have on stress hormones, lowering inflammation, helping the immune system, the different mechanisms of the actual essential oils from the forest being therapeutic and calming people's stress levels. Uh, so that's one thing that I would say uh, to do that. And the other one is social social distance, but also stay connected. So use the benefits of technology to yeah. FaceTime or Skype, like we're talking now mm -hmm. on Zoom or, you know, uh, call someone on the phone, you know, that old fashioned thing, <laughs> just <laughs> calling them. People uh, do that still? <laughs> <laughs> write a letter as long as the mail's still going. Yeah. Uh, something like that, that just to, to stay connected, 
um, but allow this time to pass and to come and go. And it's mm -hmm. going to pass. It's going to pass. And we just didn't need to be rooted in this moment and use it as a meditation practice, really, of non-resistance, of acceptance, non-judgment. Um, so I would say another thing to do is to make sure you're sticking to a schedule. If you are socially isolated, if you aren't, if you are at home, stick with the schedule. Mm -hmm. um, don't just lay around and binge watch TV all day long. Don't go. You need to find a routine because routine can create a stillness and structure and stability for you. It's good for people's mental health, but still give yourself grace and lightness. You know, if you want to watch more TV, do it then. But ultimately, I think the foundation should be have a structured uh, uh, aspect to it that works for you. Mm -hmm. um, and move, move your body. If you're inside, if you're not able to get outside, move your body, find an exercise routine that works for you. Um, eat, eat well. Like These are foundation things people should be doing anyways, but mm -hmm. it's even more of a reason to do it now. But I, there's a lot of free content online. There's great meditation apps like Calm and Headspace and many other ones. Mm -hmm. um, and there's great U YouTube videos that people can do for meditation and exercise to utilize that. Um, and basic, like, things that everybody else is talking about, about washing your hands and being smart with that and supplements that I've brought into my life and I'm recommending for people to consider, to look into, uh, would be things like upping vitamin C content, like mm. upping zinc content, upping uh, fat soluble vitamins like A and D and K2. These mm -hmm. are all immunoregulatory things that really help the immune system to be resilient, to be able to do what it's designed to do, which to, is to fight off viruses and to put them into remission. So those are all things that are practical that honestly I do anyways, but it's even more of a reason to focus on that and to not be lax and miss things here and there. But I think that, and a lot of this, that those nutrients that I just mentioned can come from food. So yeah. just focusing on foods that are inherently rich with these nutrients. Uh, my one hope, and this may be just what I look at in terms of is been taken from the grocery store may be, for, this may be a far fetched hope, but my hope is that people start to take more of a proactive approach on their health based on this. And I mean, you mentioned it earlier that this may be mother nature fighting back, but in a way we've, the signs are on the, on the scoreboard. We need to do a little bit more about our health than we are currently. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping that you know, and the aisles of my grocery store, as I'm sure with yours are, are kind of a little bit empty right now. And the things that have been removed are, are the gluten containing products, but I hope that there is this transition into a healthier lifestyle going forward. Yeah, me too. Me too. I really think we could come out of this more resilient and smarter and wiser. And we all had a wake up call Yeah. Um, I, on a macro level and on a, on a personal level. I hope that we had a good, healthy wake up call Absolutely. on how we do, do life personally and globally. Mm -hmm. I want to transition into the book because that was the re original reason for the podcast before all of this news broke the inflammation spectrum and one of the first, one of the best quotes <laughs> that you give in the intro was uh, there's no Switzerland of food. And I I'm going to steal that in some sort of presentation in the future. I will quote you, but can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. And I've been saying that for a long time, actually, and like in other articles and things, but uh, it's funny that you got my strange play on words, you know, and there's no, neutral. I, I, I enjoy it. Right. Like, yeah. I'm history, so this is great. There's no neutral food. There's no, no food is instructing our biochemistry. And actually this is my wife and I were talking about this last night with a friend, like the inflammation spectrum, even more now than ever, I think the message of it's really important for the human immune system because inflammation is a product of the immune system. Mm -hmm. So when you're dealing with chronic inflammation and honestly, when you look at the people, not to bring it back to COVID again, but the, uh, the um, over immune reactivity for some people's lungs, like some people's immune systems already stressed out. And then you put a virus in there and it triggers this hyper inflammatory immune response. And then what's really getting them is the lung 
over the, the, the actual consumption of the immune system overreacting and causing viral pneumonia, and then they die from that. Mm -hmm. So we have to be ultimately mindful of what the immune system's designed to do and creating a stable, balanced, logical immune system where it can fight off the virus or fight off the bacteria, whatever you're talking about in life, but can calm back down. Many people's immune systems are already taxed and then of some, something like a virus can trigger that and set it over the edge and they can't rebound from it. So what um, I'm discussing in the inflammation spectrum is how every food we eat either feeds inflammation or fights it. It balances the immune system or imbalances the immune system. So we want a balanced immune system. Uh, inflammation is not inherently bad. It is, it is a, a, the Goldilocks principle. We want inflammation to be high when there's a virus and fight off that virus. But we also want it to calm down afterwards and not create chronic infections and viral pneumonias that last forever and be very bad. We want there to be homeostasis in the body when it comes to inflammation and the immune system. So when I said about there's no Switzerland meal, there's no neutral food in the inflammation spectrum, what I'm saying is that every food we eat instructs our biochemistry. It's feeding inflammation or fighting it. And we are all different. So the goal of the book is to find out what your body loves, yeah. to calm inflammation, to balance the immune system, to have a resilient immune system. So that's, that's really the message of the book. So it's an exploration of foods to find out how to use food to balance your immune system, but it's also an exploration of non-food things like we just were talking about, like stress and you know, social connection mm -hmm. uh, and, and social media and how these things can bring inflammation or calm inflammation levels too, because it's not just about what you're feeding your body, it's what you're feeding your mind and your soul mm -hmm. as well. So that, that's food as, as well for our biochemistry. Well, coming from a functional medicine standpoint, and functional medicine is rooted in a lot of testing, but one of the more controversial tests out there is food sensitivity testing. Mm -hmm. How do you look at food sensitivity testing, both within your own practice, but just more broadly, and then applying it towards a person individualizing their own food plan? So... We've come a, far, a long way. I think there's some definitely good, solid food sensitivity testing out there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a sidebar in the inflammation spectrum where I talk about it. There's a place for it. But it's not the gold standard uh, in clinical nutrition. It's not the gold standard in functional medicine. Um, a properly formulated elimination diet is the gold standard at this point. Okay. So that's really what I walk people through in the in the inflammation spectrum how to do it what what type of elimination diet should you do based on your specific case because we're all different and i would say this is that with these food sensitivity testing i there's a lot of um you know i get these tests for intakes for consultations they'll give me like the labs they've had it done in the last year and i'll get these food sensitivity testing done and you'll see a lot of foods come back positive and a few things happen one is that they've designed their entire diet around this snapshot in time when they got it a year ago at 7 a.m. in the morning when they collected the test. And those labs, like all labs, are snapshots in time. You're, 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 you really can't necessarily just design 12 months worth of eating based off of that one snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. And when you see a lot of foods being positive, it's more of a sign of intestinal permeability or leaky gut syndrome and less to do about that random food that showed up as yellow or red or out, out of range. Mm -hmm. So you, the, what I, when I see that test, my mind goes to, okay, we need to help the immune system and help the gut lining integrity and help to improve gut health overall, which is 75% of the immune system. So to have a healthy immune system, you need to have a healthy gut. And when you see the immune system overreacting to these foods, it's really more to do with the overreaction of the immune system, less to do with that spinach or strawberry or whatever, kale that shows up positive on that test or that nut or that seed or whatever you're talking about. Mm -hmm. the, um, but I would say this also is that if you went to that lab a different day or a different week, you'll probably see foods being different, <laughs> yeah. different foods being positive. Mm -hmm. So what are you supposed to do? Readjust your whole life based off of a snapshot in time. So, and, and, and also, those labs can feed into people's anxiety and stress and orthorexia about what the heck am I supposed to eat? You know, mm -hmm. air and ice cubes and like low lectin bark. And that, they, they, there's nothing left in their diet that's substantial <laughs> because these foods, they're thinking, oh my gosh, these foods are causing me all these problems and I can't have, 
no, it's just that's that this, this is not an allergy test. This is a sensitivity or reactivity test. And that's the other thing too. Those words are used so interchangeably and flippantly that people come in and say, yes, I have an allergy test and you get it. And it's not an allergy test. It's mm -hmm. an immune mediated test. It's a sensitivity test or reactivity test, but it's not an allergy. So they think that they have allergies for all these things too, which probably isn't true based off of that lab data. Now we could run allergy tests to see if that's separately going on too, but that's not, you can't base that off of that sensitivity test. So I just think there's a lot of lack of context, lack of deciphering that lab, and it's not very practical for most people. Now, there's exceptions to that rule. For somebody who's cleaned up their diet, they can run a food sensitivity testing later on to see maybe it is just two or three foods that they can move their immune system in a better way by removing it for a time while they actively heal their gut. Mm -hmm. That's the bigger reason of the problem in the first place. But the other caveat is people that have autoimmunity have specific gluten reactivities, whether they're celiac or MS or somebody that has obvious responses to, to um, gluten, which is the protein mm -hmm. found in wheat, rye, oat, barley, spelt. Mm -hmm. Those, for those people, I like the cross reactivity lab. This is the gluten cross -re reactivity lab that I talk about in the book. That those are proteins in these healthy foods that are similar enough in structure to gluten that their immune system for the celiac or the autoimmune person, their immune system thinks that egg protein or quinoa protein or rice protein or chocolate protein or coffee protein or these uh, gluten-free grain proteins are gluten. So it's mm -hmm. as if they had never gone gluten-free to their immune system. So that molecular mimicry, that sort of case of mistaken identity where a person needs to go gluten-free but their immune system thinks that gluten is still being consumed on a daily basis because of these cross-reactive foods, that test is appropriate. So there are certain tools that you can use from and glean information with these diagnostic, but I don't think that everybody should just go get food sensitivity testing. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of my, my long-winded opinion on that. And that's why I talk about it in the inflammation spectrum so people can kind of find out how to actually do it in a more cost-effective way. They don't have to buy the test for this. They can actually find out what their body loves a lot cheaper and, and you know i have the audiobook and the pdf download that you have with the audiobook takes people through a quiz and i love that <clears throat> one of the areas that you kept mentioning was the presence of leaky gut or intestinal permeability what percentage of people would you say that come into your clinic or see you virtually have intestinal permeability because i've heard numbers that are absurdly high or you know people kind of like to take the middle of the road approach yeah, and I would venture to say that, again, I'm seeing not the average person. I'm seeing a lot of people with autoimmunity. I'm seeing a lot of people with chronic inflammatory problems impacting their brain, like anxiety, depression, fatigue, seeing a lot of hormonal problems and digestive problems. So my patient base is really skewed to people that research would point to having a higher rate of intestinal permeability. Yeah. So I see it pretty often, but I'm not, I don't know the average American. Most mm -hmm. people in our space would probably say most Americans have some level of intestinal permeability. And I think that's a, a good assumption to say the majority do. I don't know how much do, but my patient base is very, very common um, because I'm pe dealing with people. But if you look at the studies like uh, Alessia Fasano and the people that are really looking at this, they almost would say that some level of intestinal permeability is a precondition for things like autoimmunity yeah. and this larger autoimmune inflammation spectrum that I talk about in the book where there's silent autoimmunity, meaning if you ran labs, you'd see some things off, but the person feels all right. Mm -hmm. And then stage two is autoimmune reactivity, meaning they have symptoms, they don't feel well, but it doesn't fit all the criteria of conventional medicine to call it a full-blown autoimmune disease. By the time somebody's diagnosed with autoimmune disease, you have to have significant destruction of certain parts of your body for mainstream medicine to call it what it is. Mm -hmm. So Addison's disease, for example, autoimmune adrenal yeah. disease requires 90% destruction of the adrenal glands, MS, celiac disease. You have to have about 70 or more percentage destruction of the myelin sheath or villi of the gut, whatever you're talking about, for conventional medicine to say, hey, we caught it on an imaging study or this is, we see this, this is what it is, let's label you with this ICD-10 or this diagnosis code if you're outside of the States. So the, but research estimates that four to 10 years prior to that diagnosis yeah. is when things 
we're brewing on this autoimmune inflammation spectrum. So that's really what the inflammation spectrum is about. It's this, no matter where you're at on the inflammation spectrum, you may not be diagnosable, even though many of our patients are, but there are many people in this middle space where they don't feel well, they, they, and, but they aren't, they're told hey, it looks autoimmune or maybe like an ANA is positive or they have a family history of autoimmunity or, you know, it's, they know it's inflammatory, but it's not obviously autoimmune yet. So it's, it's that sort of space that we, we talk to people to so they can start to calm and do what they can to reclaim their health. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of take us through a time series when you're working with a patient, do they come in with labs before they see you or are they, is there a thorough intake, a discussion, and then maybe you start a protocol for them on leaky gut and then they go for labs? How does that, how does that look for you? Most of our patients have labs from other doctors because oh, okay. um, again, we're normally not their first like introduction into all of this, but gotcha. there are some patients that have old labs. Mm -hmm. You know, and at that point, I don't require people to have labs for a consultation because I want to know what labs are even relevant because some of these labs, especially in the functional medicine space, aren't covered by insurance. So I want to do a thorough health history to see what's even relevant for that person to run because I want to be comprehensive, but still be cost effective and smart and practical. So I can fine tune through a comprehensive health history during that consultation to see, okay, what's the most relevant labs for you so we're not shooting in the dark and i'm like without talking to somebody at length i don't know what labs they should be having for car consultation so that's the something that we need to really value more and something i really respect is a really thorough health history and asking a lot of questions and being curious kind of earlier what i've said um with you know how that's informed me with different other things other than seeing patients is that just to be a good practitioner you need to be curious and hold space mm -hmm. for somebody that's going through a uh, heavy things. So that's the, what I call the duality of functional medicine. There's the science of it, like really knowing your stuff clinically, but then there's the art of it. And that's holding space for somebody. That's the space in between words. It's seeing little looks in their eyes or the way, the tone of their words, the language that they're using, yeah, body language. It's, mm -hmm. and we're seeing patients online and, and it's, you're not even in the room with them to feel that energetically, but you just know you've kind of refined that art over the past 11 years for me, but just to know where we should go. So that health history conforms, okay, this lab and this lab and this lab would be good. This is the next step. So to answer your question, I don't need new labs to get started. I want a good health history to get started and the good health history will say, okay, this lab, this lab, and this lab will work. Now, if there are some people with labs that are recent, then of course I'll use them too. Like, oh, cool. You had this lab done like four months ago. Let's, let's use that. But um, I don't always have that. So I have to kind of start with the health history. Mm -hmm. And now I want to compare sort of your elimination diet versus some of the others out there can think of like Whole30, for instance, or there's that classic book, and I have it over here, called The Elimination Diet, right, uh, whereby you eliminate so many foods for a very long period of time. But you give a very thorough survey for people to start to identify which types of foods to eliminate. <laughs> Knowing the listener base, there's a lot of driven people on listening to this and driven ambitious people tend to have that characteristic of anxiety right and foods that may contribute to that anxiety i'd love to hear just sort of your thoughts because i know one of the the quiz sections is neurological so can we just go a little bit through that yeah specifically around brain health or yeah please that's great anxiety yeah so yeah, I started the book out with a quiz and the quiz is adapted from questions they ask patients, actually that health history that I just talked about. So it's really just, I just uh, formulated the quiz to be user-friendly so they can go through the seven main sections of the inflammation spectrum as I see it. This is all sort of just my mental invention, but th this is a very, it is anybody in functional medicine will kind of say, okay, yeah, that is what we see. So the gut, the brain, and the connection between the two, mm -hmm. hormones, blood sugar regulatory system, detoxification system, musculoskeletal system, if I didn't say that, autoimmunity is a separate entity. And then the eighth section is the interconnectedness of the seven, or the, what I call poly-inflammation. Mm -hmm. Inflammation in one area can beget a ripple effect of inflammation in another mm -hmm. area. So 
like for example, inflammation in the gut can beget inflammation in the brain or vice versa, this sort of bi-directional relationship between the gut and the brain. So once people take that quiz, they can find out where am I at on the inflammation spectrum, meaning how high or how low infl is inflammation seemingly to be in my body this obviously isn't a lab uh, which is this more definitive but this is subjectively uh telling you which questionnaires are very helpful in health it's they're very good metrics to gauge improvement uh so we are looking at subjectively the data as far as where your inflammation levels are and then more importantly where or not i shouldn't say more importantly but also importantly is where inflammation levels are being impacting or impacting you the most. So to use your example of the brain, most people think of mental health as separate than physical health, but yeah. in the functional medicine, the way that we see it and way research is now pointing to is and confirming how we see it is that mental health is not separate, separate from physical health. Mental health is physical health. Our brain is part of our body. We cannot separate it, separate it as some separate thing. Um, you know, Dr. Amen, uh, Daniel Amen said it best a couple of weeks ago when I, when I was talking to him. He said, psychiatry is the only field of medicine that doesn't look at the organ it treats. Like we like to look, <laughs> like we think of just this mental health thing. Well, no, our brain is being impacted by this. So there's amazing research coming out looking at the microglial cells, the brain's immune system um, as a component to mental health. So, and there's a field of research referred to as the cytokine model of cognitive function. Cytokines are pro-inflammatory cells. Microglial cells are really what researchers are looking at, at being this sort of triggered inflammatory response. And looking at anxiety and depression and fatigue and brain fog, all of, and ADD, ADHD, and autism too, and having these neuroinflammatory responses and how that microglial cell in balance, going back to immune balance, in balance, the microglial cell checks on your neurons and checks on your, on your brain and cleans things up very nicely. But when it's triggered, when there's out of balance, inflammation out of balance, that microglial cell starts to actually kill neurons and creating uh, this neuroinflammatory cascade that is linked to all these mental health issues that I just mentioned. So food is a modulator of inflammation again so every food we eat like i mentioned earlier brings inflammation up bring inflammation down so we want to look at these foods that researchers point researchers point to as potentially causing inflammation in some people but we're all different so i want the person to do their own end of one experiment to say okay what foods work for me mm -hmm. not because some guy says it in a book but just do their own food experiment and see what works for them and what people will find is, you know, it, depending on their quiz score, we talk about the core four foods, mm -hmm. which are grains, added sugar, high omega-6 oil, industrial seed oils like canola oil and vegetable oil, and dairy. And I, we have a nuanced conversation in the book. So we talk about grass-fed versus, you know, not grass-fed, A2 versus A1 casein. We get really nitty-gritty in the reintroduction stage. But... For all intents and purposes, I'm just lumping that together. We, the same with grains. We talk about sprouted and we talk about organic and not gluten versus non-gluten, but we're just keeping it simple at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But And then the eliminate track is the core four plus four or more. So those are the people that scored higher on the inflammation spectrum quiz. So you do the core four plus you remove four more foods because your inflammation levels are higher and the intervention is going to be higher. So that's adding in nightshades, peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, goji berries, white potatoes, nuts and seeds, legumes, and eggs, mm -hmm. especially the eliminate that four or more above the core four foods. All those are healthy foods, like generally speaking, right? They're not inherently bad. They're all from the earth. They're, I, I, there's many people that do fine with those foods, especially if they're properly preparing them, but we're all different. And what I want person to, the, the reader to find is maybe they, maybe they do f good on five of those foods, but not three. Maybe they do with good with six of the foods, but not two. But removing those foods will dramatically change inflammation levels in their body, and in turn, be lowering that bucket of inflammation that's impacting their brain. To use that as an example, but that can impact hormones and gut and their muscles and joints and all these different systems of the body, um, because the albumin in the egg white, the uh, casein in the dairy, the lectins and phytates in the in the legumes and the nuts and seeds and the grains 
all of these can be problematic, the alkaloids and the nightshades. So all of these compounds can be problems for some people because of this intestinal permeability that's going on. So we're actively healing the gut, we're lowering inflammation, and then we're removing this for four foods for, for four weeks for core four and removing the eight foods for eight weeks for eliminate. And then we have that systematic reintroduction, uh, which is just based on functional medicine principles of what, how to lean into from the statistically the most, uh, I would say the least problematic ones to the most problematic ones. But that's general in and of itself, because you may find that the some of the low problematic ones are problematic for you and the least problematic or the most problematic ones, sorry, are not problematic for you. Bio-individuality. So this is the system that I'm teaching in the book. Mm -hmm. Do you find eight weeks to be enough for most people to eliminate or because you hear elimination protocols sometimes lasting out to a year before you reintroduce. Uh, is eight weeks enough for most people or if they are severely inflamed, does it have to be longer? It's, it's enough for people to get an answer on their reintroduction. Gotcha. It's not enough to get everybody to where they need to go health wise. So it's, and that's a really a deep conversation that I have in the book is like, look, this, just because if you're bringing a food back in after eight weeks and you're having a problem, doesn't mean that you can't have that food forever. You may have just reintroduced it too soon. Yeah. Uh, and that's a conversation I have for pay, with patients too, but I'm having it with the reader in the book to say like, look, like let's <clears throat> give us more time. So we look at this data of showing that gastrointestinal systems, many people that have this higher inflammation levels require 18, 24 months for some people to really get to the place of their maximum resilience. Mm -hmm. And that could be you know, 70% better than they used to be or 100% better, but it's gonna take that sort of time to calm things down. Because again, there are many complex, difficult, severe cases out there. Of course. Uh, and that's where the quiz is supposed to be sort of a, a way to see. And they can retake the quiz when, after eight weeks, retest it, yeah. the quiz. And I would assume the vast majority of them are going to dramatically reduce their inflammation levels. And they'll be able to see that on the quiz, but they're not going to be 100% in eight weeks. So that mm -hmm. requires maybe more time to give, give, that, give the system more time. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it can be run like the MSQ, where you're yeah. or a promise ten questionnaire, where you're taking it every month and just seeing how that person is checking in, right? Totally, yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, while you're doing these elimination protocols, are, are you doing uh, adding on additional supplements in order to heal the gut? Like, for instance, uh, glutamine, you hear tossed around a lot in these conversations. Are you adding additional supplements for your for your patients as well? Yeah. So the, after that quiz in the book, uh, there's based on where their focus point is, they have a toolbox. So mm -hmm. remember I mentioned the seven sections. I know, you know, it's cause you listen to the book, but basically you know, maybe you will have a score higher in the brain or the higher in the hormones or higher in the gut. You have your own set of supplements to focus on, um, to further tailor and personalize all of this. Cause mm -hmm. maybe, you know, for somebody that maybe they don't score higher in the hormones at all. Well, why would you want to be focusing extra stuff on your hormones? I mean, not that it's going to hurt you. It's not, but if you're going to be spending your money and you're focused on something that's irrelevant to you. So I'd rather like narrow down, okay, like the gut, my gut score high is a lot higher than the rest of them. I'm going to really focus on this. And that's another major principle of functional medicine. It's bioindividuality. It's what's right, right for my body. And just because something's healthy or real food or organic or herbal doesn't necessarily mean it's appropriate for you. So the mm -hmm. quiz can not only say, okay, subjectively, where is inflammation levels in my body and where should I focus, what levels are the highest, but okay, what are some things I can bring during my elimination diet experience to target the things that are highest in me? Um, so yeah, that's definitely something we deal with. And then those non-food components too. So over the four weeks for the core four plan or the eight weeks for the eliminate plan, they will have um, non-food things to be mindful of. And those are more insidious in a way where it's like, okay, we're dealing with foods and it's pretty straightforward for self-experimentation, but not everybody's going to have the same non-food inflamers. So there's eight of them in the book, but I want the reader to sort of grab the ones that, that are the most problematic for them. Because like I say in the book, you could be eating really healthy foods, but if you're serving your body a big slice of stress every day or a toxic relationship you know, with social media or 
you're not getting enough sleep, that's, those are going to be inflammatory too. So th I want them to pick these non-food inflammers too and say, okay, mm -hmm. not just going to deal about food and realize these non-food things are in some, for some people, bigger modulators of their biochemistry more than food. But obviously it starts with food because everybody's eating, but I want people to grab these non-food inflamers too, because those are also very powerful modulators of their health. Mm -hmm. It's one of the more, I'm assuming just because you're in the United States, I know you see people around the world, but statistics on sleep in the United States are pretty hor horrific. Is that yeah. a pretty common one among people that just don't sleep very well? Yeah, it is. The quality and the quantity of sleep is really um, poor. Um, mm -hmm. And we just don't respect it very much. I mean, we, we just, we, it's almost like uh, it gets in the way in many ways. And people will say like, oh, I just love sleep. I wish I could sleep. But they don't really give it the the value and the respect that it needs. It's almost like uh, this thing that comes as an afterthought to everything else. Yeah. And they're not setting themselves up for res restful, restorative sleep. Yeah. You and I grew up with you know, some of these rappers coming out with like sleep is the cousin of death. Right. And you know, it's, it's just funny because I used to entrain that in my mind that, Hey, I only needed four hours of sleep. It turns out that it's probably accelerating that death rate a little bit if I actually followed yeah. their advice. Yeah. Really bad advice. <laughs> yeah, it's really bad advice. Yeah. So we, it, cause just one night of poor sleep has been shown to spike high sensitivity C reactor protein, this inflammatory mm -hmm. marker, one night of poor sleep, let alone this epidemic of sleep disorders and lack of sleep that's going on. And it's the sleep disorder spectrum. There's a lot of things that can be going on. Is it, is it sleep apnea? Is it too much caffeine? Is it too much sugar? Is it too much stress? Uh, is it too much technology with the blue light impact that that's having? We have to look at what are these sleep impactors, negative sleep impactors, and as they call it, sleep hygiene, like really cultivating a good sleep hygiene practices, which, which we talk about in the book. We give people practical tools, a lot of low cost to no cost tools to really bring into their life to restore their sleep, to help repair their body. Their body needs to repair through the night. Mm -hmm. And those microglial cells that I just mentioned in the brain, it does a lot of pruning and cleaning and autophagy at night. Mm -hmm. So so allow your body to repair things in a balanced way through the, throughout the night. Well, well, you mentioned your patient base. There are people that come in with autoimmune conditions. And one trending diet that has just been fascinating to me is the carnivore diet. How do you look at that as a functional medicine practitioner? Because you're abandoning an entire macronutrient, but I would love to hear just your thoughts because you've seen some pretty amazing success stories with certain people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you would think you know, my first book, Ketotarian, is a mostly plant-based ketogenic book, which I know we've talked about last time. Yeah. You think, what, what's the author of Ketotarian going to think about the carnivore diet? But um, it's a tool that I use for people that really need it. Uh, it's a well-formulated nutrients carnivore diet for time being. It's not forever and ever. Yeah. I'm not doing it for years so, on end. So you're not going to support the three-decade carnivore people out there? No. I, <laughs> is that a thing? I didn't know. Uh, I, I think there's, there's a couple people that have been claiming to do it for multiple decades, which, uh, mm. you know, obviously documentation isn't support. They don't have it, but yeah. It'd be interesting. It would be very interesting to see what happens long term on the carnivore diet. Yeah. Look, and if it works for somebody, if it truly is their biochemistry, it really works for them. Their labs look great. I don't think we have any data. I haven't seen any <laughs> that long of data on people. But um, in the short term, I think it's a, a, a necessary intervention for some people. And it is an ultimate elimination diet for a while. For people that have these overt, crazy food sensitivities, which some of my patients have. Uh, you are going to, even the core four and the eliminate is not going to be a strong enough intervention for these people. So you have to go the extra mile. And we have as a sidebar at the end of the inflammation spectrum that talks about histamines and salicylates and oxalates and all of the, all these other plant compounds that can be problematic. So those additional histamines, oxalates, salicylates, all these other stuff, a, a clean, well-formulated carnivore diet can be appropriate for them for a time being. And then you have to lean into soft cooked pureed foods and bone broth stews and soups for and lean back into that because what my concern with a carnivore diet for the average person long term is that it's going to cause them to have an overreaction to more foods in the long run 
Mm-hmm. Because the reality is it's not going to be sustainable for most people. Look, if you're a, a type A 1% biohacker, like superhero human being, then maybe you can do it a longer period of time. But I would venture to say even th- those people aren't going to do it forever and ever. They mm-hmm. may be carnivore adjacent. They may be, as Paul Saladino calls it, call of carnivore-ish. And I love Paul, Paul Saladino. He's an awesome guy, friend of mine. I, 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 we have more in common than separate. But I would say for the average person, and I, that's who I talk to, uh, consult, I don't deal with the, the people that are just tr- experimenting this for the sake of it. It's because they have to do it. Um, so for a while, uh, that can be a time, it could be good to calm things down, but then you want to reintroduce. But if you do it forever for a long period of time, my assumption, and not just assumption, what I have seen clinically, is that things that they didn't have a reaction to, or they're re- they can't even digest the simplest of soft cooked pureed vegetables. And it's similar to me as the vegan that has a problem when they bring meat in, they can't digest meat. Mm-hmm. So what do you say to the vegan then? They, they, that the meat is, is, they're having an intolerance to meat? Uh, no, it's <laughs> their microbiome is shifted and their hypochlorhydria, or the decreased hydrochloric acid, they're not even able, they don't have the proper enzymes in the microbiome and the stomach acid to break down these foods. I believe that's the same thing that's happening with long-term carnivore people. The things they would never had a problem with before, now they have a problem with more things. And not to say that's irreversible, just like the vegan is able to rebuild and shift their microbiome and HCL production and their way to digest certain meats. The same thing that would happen for a long, long-term long carnivore. But I feel like what the good out of it is then it's like more is better. Well, okay, there's a lack of balance. There's a lack of middle of the road sort of thing. And I think the truth oftentimes somewhere in the middle is that you can be carnivore-ish, you can be carnivore adjacent if you want to do that and it's working for you. But I don't think an exclusive carnivore diet for long term is really going to be practical or pragmatic or even desirable for most human beings. Mm-hmm. Uh, last question before I transition just into the final three, but fasting, how do you layer in fasting with all of this? Do you like time restricted feeding is getting a lot of attention right now. How do you look at that with most clients? Is it better for males versus females? It does it. I guess it's all bio individual, but do you try and guide people towards a certain eating window? So there's definitely some caveats that men versus women should make over men. Um, and I talk about this in keto and that mm-hmm. women tend to have higher levels of kiss peptin. They make, make, make them more sensitive to caloric restriction and fasting windows. If it's impacting your cycle, if it's impacting your, your period, then, then you want to lean lighter. I'm talking generalities here, yeah. but there are some women that have endometriosis or PCOS or insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, those women are going to do better, generally speaking, with a little bit more fasting, more like some guys. So to lump women all in one bracket is not fair because all women have different things, just like all men have different things going on with their health. So what's your starting point is really the the uh, question, but I'm a fan of it. It's just start off low and slow, lean into it. It's an amazing tool to gain metabolic flexibility. I think it's wonderful, exciting research around it, but more isn't always better. You can find a balance and find a grace and a lightness to it. Cause my concern with it is if it's done, you know, with good intentions, but it's done like more is better. And we're just going to fast our way out of this. Uh, I, I feel like it could and then become this disordered eating and it's then mm-hmm. an eating disorder disguised as a wellness practice and orthorexia and all this type of problem. I don't think that's good. But as long as there's context as a grace and a lightness to it, I think it's a great tool to have, but you don't have to be super aggressive with it to get some of the benefits that research is pointing to. Mm-hmm. You know, one key message for everybody is that definitely yeah and you keep banging on this is bio individuality, right? And it's mm-hmm. just we're all individual and i love that message i love that message coming from the book first of the first of the final three questions and i i told you this before the show i'm amazed that you're able to keep this all going and everything how do you or what's your top trick for enhancing focus um i would for me it's mindfulness practice it's that's to me the the genesis of a great focus day it's it's being present with that patient that I'm consulting and really just listening to them, holding space for them, or 
if it's just, if I'm writing an article, it's being rooted in that present moment. So it's present moment awareness is to me the best thing I could do uh, for focus. And present moment awareness, did you develop that practice by initially reading Eckhart Tolle or something or what, where mm-hmm. did it come from? Yeah, it came from him. Yeah, that, his two books, Eckhart, Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now and New Earth, to me are the most like mm-hmm. fundamental human books of just logical living. Um, cause you don't have to be any sort of one way. You don't have to be any, you don't even have to be super spiritual, uh, to really say, okay, this is a logical way of, of living. Uh, so oh, I do practice a lot of his principles just, uh, on a daily basis. And it, it's from him for sure. What book has significantly impacted how you live your life? And you may have just answered it. <laughs> Yeah, I, the, the, those two books are probably the most like day-to-day basis. Those to me are the most impactful books for me. Yeah. What excites you most about the health world right now? I think it's people waking up to the aspect of bioindividuality. It's, it's, the, it's the spectrum. And I think that the, the reason why I wanted that book title to be the inflammation spectrum is because it's not just inflammation that exists on a spectrum it's humanity exists on a spectrum so i think that just looking at these tools that we have and picking up the tools that work for you sustainably and to me that's like the the coolest thing that i see people waking up to um yeah so that's what i'm excited about amazing dr cole where can people find out more about you uh, everybody can get all the information at drwillcole.com. That's D-R-W-I-L-L-C-O-L-E.com. Same on Instagram, at Dr. Will Cole, Twitter, Facebook, all those places. Amazing. Dr. Cole, thank you for taking the time, round two. And I yeah. really appreciate catching up with you as always. And uh, yes, thank at you. some point, I'm going to seek your advice on how to structure my, cons- my consulting practice. Yeah, anytime. I'm here. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. To all the superhumans listening out there, have an epic day.